Hello, welcome to Gardener's World on a beautiful, bright, frosty morning here at Long Meadow. These spring frosts can catch some early flowering plants unawares, but they make this gardener's heart sing. You suddenly feel full of life, full of light and full of energy. And there's quite a lot to do in the garden. I've just cleared this bed of kale. I sowed it last March. We started picking it when the leaves were young in May and we've been eating it ever since. So a whole year has passed. You can see if I pick up a stalk, that just a little sprouty bit at the top, but all the way up these leaves came through. And the great thing about this kale, which is Cavalier Nero, black Tuscan kale, is that it's sweet, it cooks like spinach, you can use it in soups and stews, it makes fantastic pasta sauce. Time now for it to go to the compost heap and I can clear that bed. Now in today's programme, as well as working in the vegetable garden, I'm planting an amelanchia, I'll be working in the jewel garden and sowing some vegetable seeds ready for planting out when the ground warms up. Right, this can be shredded. This week, in his last of three films looking at the garden tree, Joe is learning how best to prune them. Oh yeah, that makes a big difference actually, eh? And to show us houseplants as we've never seen them before, Mick Bailey goes to Barbican to visit a conservatory of giants. This has got to be the classic icon of 70s interiors, the Swiss cheese plant. Here you can see the specimen is probably 25 metres tall. And last summer, we visited a garden in Oxfordshire that is crammed with clematis. Like most people, what attracted me to clematis was a large flower. But the more you grow them, the more you come to realise it's the small flowers that are more beautiful and so much more diverse. outside you too. This book, The Vegetable Garden Display, published by the RHS, originally in 1941 as part of the Dig for Victory campaign, really fired my enthusiasm for gardening. I'd gone since I was seven, uh, but it was a chore. It was a household duty and I learned a lot, but I didn't learn how to love it. And it wasn't until I got a copy of this book, I was 17, and I looked at the pictures one of them was a celery trench, and I just thought it was a thing of incredible beauty. The whole business of, of growing things was as good as the end result. Celery has a special place in my heart, and I'm going to sow some now. Now, there are two types of celery. Celery in the uh, vegetable garden displayed, if you like, is the old-fashioned type, which is trench celery, which isn't self-blanching. And I will grow that, but today I'm going to grow some self-blanching celery. And that can be grown on the level ground. You sow it in a block or a grid, and you can harvest it from September onwards. I've got some seed compost, and I'm going to sow a variety called Tall Utah. Celery seeds are tiny, and the seedlings, when they emerge, are tiny too. And I will then prick them out into plugs and grow them on. Now, what I'm going to do is press them into the compost like that and that's to stop them moving around when I water them. Water them lightly and importantly put them somewhere warm. Celery needs heat to germinate. Start them now, grow them on, prick them out, harden them off and they'll be ready to plant outside around about early May. Now this greenhouse is heated but only to stop it being cold rather than to make it actively warm. One of the things that surprised me this year is that the amaryllis have loved it. There is something about coming to a greenhouse on a grey, wet day and finding plants that are exotic and lift your spirits. But if you don't have your own, you can go and visit other people's. And Nick Bailey, the head gardener at Chelsea Physic Garden, has gone to visit a spectacular greenhouse in a surprising location of concrete it's brutalist architecture at its best or, or its worst depending on your opinion uh, this is ficus benjamina it's one of the plants you always find in offices or tucked away at the back of a lounge now ordinarily in the home they can maybe grow to about six foot this is growing to its full size you know the same size it would grow in the tropics so 20 20 plus meters but at home 
you can keep it down to about six foot, nice sort of tight, tight column. In fact, the only thing it objects to is, uh, is cold draft, so you need to be careful of that. Otherwise, it will keep performing for you. This has got to be one of the plants that virtually everybody knows. It's commonly called money plant or, uh, or the jade plant. Uh, but its botanic name is Crassula ovata. It comes from South Africa and it grows in really hot, dry conditions. So if you want to grow it well at home, go for a really sort of hot, sunny windowsill. I absolutely love it there. Small windowsill plants are fairly unlikely to flower, but once they get to sort of above, about, this is looking amazing on the windowsill. This has got to be the, the classic icon of, uh, of 70s interiors, the Swiss cheese plant, or uh, Monstera deliciosa. And that name is really pertinent. It's the delicious monster, so monstrous leaves. And deliciosa references its fruit, uh, and it produces these conical fruits, which have a, an almost sort of custard apple, so a very, very sort of sweet, uh, sweet flavour to them. You can get it to fruit at home. Here you can see the specimen is probably 25 metres tall and it sort of has such, such dramatic architectural foliage. I think bring the 70s back, we need, uh, we need some monsteras back in our life. Nurtured in our homes, these amazing plants totally transform any space. And the great thing is that they can be multiplied to be shared with loved ones. You just need to propagate them, which may sound difficult, but it's actually really simple. This trailing purple Tradescantia is a, is a perfect, perfect candidate for propagation. It's a, it's a really unusual plant in as much as it's, um, it's native to the tropical Americas and it's totally unknown in the wild now, so you can only get it from, uh, from garden centres or, or sharing with friends. So the way to take the cutting is to look for some good active growth, so it might be long trailing growth or it might be growth up at the top here. And then count down the nodes where the leaves break out. So one, two, three, four, and we're going to make a cut just at the bottom there. It's important to make sure that your, your knife and the tile that you're using are as sterile as possible. That will get rid of any nastia. What we want to do is just remove these initial lower leaves and then look at this, uh, look at this top section. So we've got some, some fairly bulky leaves up the top, so I'm just going to slice those away. And all that does is just to reduce the transpiration, so it reduces the, the water loss from the plant. You can use uh, a basic basic all-purpose compost mix. Just make yourself a, a small hole down the side, slot your cutting into there. So it wants to be pushing up against the, against the side of the pot. Firm it in. Best thing then, you can water it from overhead, but much better if you can just put it in a tray of water, allow it to soak some water up. Um, in a matter of weeks, it would have rooted through. Cuttings really aren't that, that hard to do. And what can go wrong? Hidden from plain view, secret gardens like the Barbican Conservatory offer two precious commodities, solace and inspiration. Lily! And if you'd like to visit the Barbican Conservatory, look on our website for opening hours. I long ago learned to live with the fact there are a whole range of plants that just want to the pound. Trees don't get pruned in nature, so why do we need to prune them in a garden situation? It's different because you have to maintain a safe environment if you're going to be living in and around these trees. Uh, you might have underplanting that needs some more light and nutrients, so you have to balance the, you know, the needs of both. Larger trees may be protected by the local council, so it's worth consulting a tree surgeon to check what you can do. But you don't always need to call in an expert for tree work. There's pruning you can do on your own to ensure your trees fulfil their potential. Oh now this is much more a manageable size for the average gardener. How yeah. old do you reckon this tree might be? Probably five, six years old in total and, and probably been in the ground about two years now. Okay, but there's lots that we can do now to make sure that this grows into a really good shape. Absolutely, it should be done now. It's like the ideal time to do it, to just open up and give it the, a good structure. I think we'll take off these these lowest three here, actually. Okay. Um, and that one. And that one as well on that side. Do you want to do that one? Yeah, sure. These cuts create a good, clean trunk with an even and balanced crown of branches above it. 
Right. What's happening in here? It's quite, it's quite congested in the middle of the tree, isn't it? It is there, and you've got this one, two, and three branches all growing in the same direction there, too close together, really. So it's just a case of spacing those out. And I would suggest it's this centre one that goes here because it will get rid of this slightly crossing branch we've got here anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'll just lean in there and take, take that one out now. I think that's great, really mm -hmm. nicely balanced. It's sort of standing up proudly, it does, isn't it? It does, it's really nice. So how often do you need to do this sort of pruning? Is it annually, every five years? I would say check it every year, just to make sure there isn't anything untoward, but generally, if it's like a human, if you cut a tree, its wound can heal, but it's important to get the cuts right. This is a really lovely ash. Yeah. It's got a great canopy to it. Yeah. It's delicate at the moment. Yeah. Now, say you want to take this branch off, because actually it's quite, it's quite low, and it's sort of going out quite a, a low angle as well. Where exactly should you cut? So firstly, you need to take the weight off the branch. So cut it and leave a stub at first. And then once you've got the stub, you can be quite precise. And you cut it just in front of that collar there. And that will allow the, the tree to seal up the wound as quickly as possible. Because otherwise, it's always going to be an open wound and entry point for the decay fungi to get into the, the rest of the tree. One way to transform a young tree is to give it a crown lift, which can help create space under the branches for mowing or for underplanting. Right, so how high do you want to go with this? How much do you want to take off the ball? I think these four here, one, two, three, four, okay. um, and that's really going to be about one third of the total height, and that's a good rule of thumb for crown lifting. One third exposed stem, two thirds crown. Now, autumn is definitely the best time with birches, isn't it? It is, yeah. Uh, in the spring is actually a bad time to, to prune them because they the sap is rising and they'll bleed profusely if you do it then. Yeah, OK. So you're going to get that one off? This one here, yep. OK. It's lovely to reveal the stem of a silver birch, but they respond best if they're pruned while young. Yeah. Let's have a little look at that there, see one. Oh, yeah. That makes a big difference, actually. Yeah, you were right. Great, you were yeah. definitely right. And just as transformed was the copper beech that Jamie's team had been pruning. That looks so much better. Mm. Doesn't it? Yeah. It really has made a huge difference. Yeah. I mean, the trunk lights up, and now you can see the branches within the tree yeah. and the whole shape of it. Yeah. And the view has opened up completely. Yeah. Don't be afraid to prune your trees. Obviously, if they're this big, you've got to call the experts in. But smaller trees in your garden, you can get your secateurs out, your pruning saw out, and you can shape their future. I remember on my one and only trip to Japan, although I hope not my last, being astounded by the extent of the pruning that went on with the trees. I never once in two weeks saw a tree in a park, a street, let alone a garden, that wasn't pruned to the point of manicuring. It was a real insight into what you can do, if you want to, with almost any kind of tree. Now, far from trees, I want to sow some climbers, some annual climbers, most of us grow sweet peas, which work very well, but these uh, are tender. So if I sow them now to mid-May, and I've got some cobia here, cobia scandens, which won't even start flowering till late summer. Last time I grew them, which was two years ago, the flowers appeared in September. But they were fantastic, and they went on flowering until the first frosts, which were November. You need to sow the seed now into pots. So I've got purple here, which I will grow again, probably in a pot, uh, in a jewel garden. And the seeds are fairly large, and I'm going to grow two to a pot. So just push them in on their side, whichever seedling grows strongest. I'll leave and then take out the other. And I'll probably plant three or four plants to a large pot. I'm using a seed compost, but they are going to be in the pot for quite a long time, so you may want to enrich it a bit. A general purpose compost will actually do fine. Kabir likes rich soil, plenty of moisture, good drainage, but they are greedy, hungry feeders, and they respond to warmth. So when you position them, put them somewhere sunny and sheltered. I'll water those, put them somewhere warm, and I won't plant these out until early June. Now, these will climb and do their stuff just for a relatively short season. But of course, 
We grow climatists and expect them to reappear year after year. And most of us have some in our gardens and really enjoy them. But very, very few people on this planet will either love clematis as much as Mike Brown does or grow as many in their garden. I was in the RAF for 30 years and 67 was when we bought our first house. And I remember going straight out and buying Jack Marnie, which I still grow because it's, it's a wonderful clematis. And then slowly, as we moved around, um, I gradually increased. But until about 15, 20 years ago, I would never got above 40. But now, uh, I don't know, three or four hundred, I suppose. Like most people, what attracted me to clematis was a large flower, because they are so showy. But the more you grow them, the more you come to realise it's the small flowers that are more, more beautiful and so much more diverse. This clematis is called Vitalba, old man's beard, as a parent. Uh, most of them would be much too rampant to grow in the garden, so you get infested. Where this one is a sterile hybrid, it will hide anything. This was flower for three and a half, four months, and there's no work to do at the end. All you do is chop it back to about 10 or 12 inches. Here, we've got a couple of interesting clematis, really. They're both pretty sellers, but very different. This one is called Betty Cornyn, and it's one of the best scented clematis there are. And it's one of very few where you don't actually need the sunshine Providing you've got 20 degrees C, you will get a lovely scent. The other one has two names. The original name was Flora Plena, but it disappeared from cultivation for many generations. Eventually, it was discovered again and was brought onto the market about the same time as it took up the ship, the Mary Rose. So it's come back on the market as Mary Rose. Because this area is South Basin, put pipes in the ground, these are about 11 inches deep. These are at an angle, so the water goes down to the root and below. What you must never do is just water the surface of the soil because the roots come up for it and now, now it's a surface rooted plant and as you get a long hot dry period you tend to lose the clematis from lack of moisture. I believe that take census is the inclematis. There's a lovely diverse colour range, but they're nearly all an urn shape. Gorgeous shape, really. Most of them are totally hardy. This lovely pink clematis is called Etoile Rose, and it contains Texensis, and it also contains Viticella, but being a complex hybrid, it contains other clematis as well. And I find anything Texensis in is beautiful. Most of the cultivars are susceptible to powdery mildew, but you can minimise it by keeping the root area clear so the air can get through it and never ever water in the foliage. Small flowered clematis are not difficult, they are beautiful and they don't wilt. They get better and better every year. Well, I absolutely agree with Mike that the late flowering clematis are my favourites because they may start a little bit late, but they go on flowering well in predators. They could range to be as big as a hedgehog, it could be as small as an insect. That will keep your garden healthy as much as anything else you can do. Come on, Nigel. finished mulching the jewel garden. This is mushroom compost. 
You better take that. And it works really well on our heavy clay because it breaks the soil down. You can use anything really that is going to work into the soil, mushroom compost, well-rotted uh, manure, garden compost, bark. They all do the same sort of job. When you're mulching, it really matters that you put it on thickly, at least two inches. And if you've got more, you can go up to four or five inches. Even. And it's going to do three things. The first is it will suppress weeds. It will stop annual weeds germinating and perennial weeds will be weaker as they grow through and easier to weed. The second is it will keep moisture. So I'd say really almost of anything else that you can do in the garden, mulching is probably the most important, certainly in spring. Now I suspect those of you who haven't yet mulched your gardens were bound to be doing it this weekend, but here are some other things you can do as well. If you get perennial weeds like bindweed or cooch grass into a border, they can be really difficult to eradicate, especially if they're growing in amongst your plants. It's almost impossible to get them out. However, it is worth trying by lifting the plant, removing what weeds you can see and as much soil as you can, and then washing the roots clear of all dirt. That way you can really see what is weed root and what is plant root. And when you feel you've removed every scrap of weed, you can replant the herbaceous perennial. If you haven't done so already, it's time to prune climbing roses. Tie in any structural growth so it's good and horizontal, and from these grow the upright side shoots. Reduce them back to a bud or two. This will stimulate new growth, and it's that new growth that will carry this year's display. The crocuses in the wild garden are loving the sunshine. They've only just appeared in the last day or two, and are just making the most of this glorious weather. And there's going to be more sunshine from Sunday, because it's the spring equinox, when daylight gets longer than night. So not only are the days getting longer, they're getting brighter. I'll see you back here at Long Meadow next Friday. Till then. Is rural development with wind farms and solar parks just a blot on the landscape in our land of home?